It is the 5th century BC. The Persian Achaemenid Empire, established half a century earlier under Cyrus the Great, stretched from northern India to southeast Europe. The Achaemenid Empire controlled a vast area with astonishingly rapid expansion and conquest, the latest of which, King Darius, was the architect of. But Darius's hunger for territorial expansion was not yet satisfied. The empire followed a pattern when incorporating new territories. After conquering lands, they incorporated its population into their administration. As a result, the army they fielded was very diverse, although commander positions were mainly reserved for the Medes and Persians. Still, the army appeared unstoppable, and its territorial expansion and consolidation was its testament. Among the empire's subjects were wealthy Ionian Greek colonists living in western Anatolia. Just like all the peoples subjugated by the Persians, they contributed to the empire's army and swore fealty to its leader. But some of the Ionians were not the loyal subordinates the Persians wanted them to be, angered by the heavy taxes and trade restrictions. During a particular violent expedition against the Scythians in the Danube Valley in 512, Darius ordered the Ionians to guard a bridge vital for his supply lines. After the Scythians bested Darius' army and the battered force retreated towards the bridge, one of the Ionian commanders, Miltiades, proposed to destroy the bridge. Other Ionian leaders overruled him and the Persian king escaped. He learned of Miltiades' proposed betrayal, swearing vengeance. Miltiades fled to Athens, where he entered politics. The animosity between the Ionians and their overlords continued to fester. This reached a boiling point in 499 BC, when a widespread Ionian revolt broke out. Understanding they were heavily outnumbered against one of the mightiest empires the world had ever seen, the Ionians appealed for help from Greek city-states. Sparta, the dominant military powerhouse in Greece, and others refused. But Athens, once again defying Persia's might, sent 20 warships. Eritrea sent another five. The rebels burned the city of Sardis, Persia's main stronghold in western Anatolia. Still, thanks to internal strife and the defection of several factions, the Greek fleet suffered a defeat at the 494 Battle of the island of Lade. With its control re-exerted, Darius set out to punish those who aided the rebels. The fact Miltiades, the traitor, participated in Athenian politics only strengthened his resolve. They were to be made an example of. In 492 BC, he collected an enormous fleet meant to invade Greece. A storm destroyed their initial fleet, which took two years to rebuild. Finally, in 490 BC, an enormous Persian fleet numbering 600 ships and carrying around 25,000 soldiers set out to invade the Greek mainland. Among them was a deposed Athenian tyrant to sway the pro-Persian Greeks to defect. The fleet sailed a southerly route towards Eritrea. It landed on the shores around Eritrea and the city-state was swiftly destroyed. After sacking the entire city, the Persian army set sail again. After a brief journey, they landed at Marathon. They aimed to draw away the Athenian army from the city and beat them in open battle. Before they landed, heralds had already informed the Greek city-states of the impending invasion and demanded the unconditional surrender of the city-states. Athens sent requests for aid to other city-states. The most militaristic of them all was Sparta, who likely received the request for aid from the famed runner Phidippides. Legend has it, he covered 140 miles in two days. But the Spartans were engaged in sacred ceremonies and unable to send troops. Moreover, there was lots of political infighting among the Greek city-states, with pro-Persian factions in every city. So the small army setting out to face the Persians couldn't expect much support. Only the minor city-state Plataea unexpectedly sent a contingent numbering no more than 1,000 soldiers to augment the Athenian army at the last moment. Miltiades, Persia's sworn enemy, commanded the Greek army. So the small army, without a militaristic culture, faced the largest empire the world knew, with a nearly undefeated, numerically superior force. The odds were not in the city-state's favor.
The Greeks properly deduced the Persian strategy. After ravaging Eritrea, the Persians hoped the Greeks would march against them so they would fight in the open or bypass the army and sail to Athens directly. On the Greek side were around 10,000 Athenians and 1,000 Plataeans, commanded by Callimachus and Miltiades. Their army mainly consisted of hoplites, spearmen fighting at close quarters in tight formations, usually eight ranks deep. The Persians fielded around 25,000 soldiers, archers, and 1,000 cavalry, commanded by Datis. They landed on the shores close by Marathon. The Greek defector Hippias told them this site would be ideal for deploying their cavalry, which was inherently superior to the Greek army. Datis set up camp as some scouts informed him of an advancing Athenian army, and he wasted no time deploying his army in battle formations. The Athenians had indeed marched into close proximity to the Persian landing ground. Their army deployed on the high ground around the shores facing east, blocking the Persians from moving further. The hoplites deployed in a long line. Sources mention its length was almost a mile, with an eight-man deep phalanx on both flanks, overlooking the beach. Their center was an extended thin line, four men deep. Despite being the best troops, their center was weak, and the flanks were strong. The Persians definitely enjoyed a numerical superiority and their army was much more mixed than the Athenians. They deployed with a mixture of infantry, javelin throwers, archers and cavalry scattered around the shores in a similar lengthy fashion as the Greeks. A stalemate developed lasting several days. Some sources mention eight with a two mile gap separating both sides. The Greeks were unwilling to leave their strategic positions and the Persians didn't want to risk a frontal attack against them. During the stalemate, Part of the Persian army embarked on a journey towards Athens. It left the Persians with around 15,000 soldiers. On the ninth day, a messenger reached the Greek camp with news of the fall of Eritrea. It implied the Persians were able to free up a significant force. The Athenian generals were divided in their opinions. Some were against waging battle, thinking their numbers were too few to engage the enemy. Others, including Miltiades, urged that they fight. Finally, he managed to convince the majority, and they decided to plan an attack. On the morning of September 12, Miltiades decided to launch an attack. The moment was ideal. The Persian cavalry was watering over a mile to the north. His center lines, all hoplites, charged against a mixed Persian army. In the Persian center stood mainly infantry, javelin throwers and archers. These opened fire against the advancing hoplites. Herodotus writes, the Persians, who saw the Athenians advance towards them on the double, prepared to meet their attack. They assumed that the Athenians were seized by some utterly self-destructive madness, as they observed how few Athenians were in number and how they were charging towards them, with neither cavalry nor archers in support. Sources conflict on how the sides clashed with each other. The Greek hoplites either dashed towards the Persian line near the end, making contact, or they stumbled, causing them to stagnate. As the spears and arrows tore into their ranks, the Persian infantry realized their enemy was on the back foot. This was the time to strike. They launched an energetic counterattack towards the hoplites and clashed with the vanguard. Bitter fighting broke out as the vanguard put up a spirited defense. The Persians appeared to best the hoplites. As the Athenian center struggled, both flanks kicked into action. The tightly formed phalanx charged against the Persian light infantry flanks. These were no match for the heavy Athenian infantry. Meanwhile, in the center, part of the Greek infantry appeared to break and retreat. Free fighting broke out on the flanks, but the hoplites clearly enjoyed the upper hand. They pushed the flanks of the Persians back towards the shores. These resisted pursuing the Persians as more Persian infantry was routed. They turned inward towards the exposed Persian center. Suddenly, the Persian army found itself almost enveloped. A bitter struggle broke out to prevent complete envelopment as the hoplites closed in against the light Persian troops. The Persians weren't fighting for conquest anymore, but for survival. First the rearguard, then the remainder of the army fled towards their ships. Its captains began sailing off in a panic, with some ships barely filled with soldiers. The hoplites launched an energetic pursuit. 
Fierce fighting continued on the beaches as the pursuing hoplites tried to reach the Persian vessels to prevent them from taking off. The Athenians were victorious, and as the Persians fled, the Athenians pursued them and cut them down until they reached the sea where they called for fire and started to seize the ships. Greek sources recount at least 6,400 Persian soldiers perished, whereas there were no more than 200 Greek casualties. The Athenians achieved complete victory against one of the mightiest empires ever. But they could not celebrate just yet. Instead of retreating, the Persian fleet set sail for Athens. The Persians hoped they could reach Athens before the victorious Greeks. Then they could convince the city-state they won the battle and resistance was pointless. Therefore, sending word of victory to Athens before the Persian fleet arrived was crucial. In the battle's aftermath, the Greek messenger of Hydippides reportedly ran 42 kilometers to tell the people of Athens of victory. Lucius later recounted this ordeal. Philippides, the dispatch runner, bringing the news of Marathon, he found the Archon seated in suspense regarding the issue of battle. Joy, we win, he said, and died upon this message, breathing his last in the word joy. Upon seeing the scale of the victory, the Spartans praised the Athenians. The Greek victory prevented a major Persian invasion of Europe. It elevated the Greeks as a significant regional military actor and boosted their confidence in future conflict. But the Persians weren't done yet and would try their luck another time, culminating in another invasion and the epic Battle of Salamis. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there's a person, topic, battle or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and my channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.